Wow. It's so great to see uh, two Roshis in a square next to mine. I'm just thrilled to see you guys healthy and looking well. Barbara, Joshin, and uh, Enkyo, whom I just love. And uh, I, I got to say this, I just have to say that Enkyo and I have had this agreement that for some reason, if both our spouses disappeared, we'd get together. Barbara, you may not know that. So I already have one out of the way, Enkyo. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. Um, but she is my older, highly respected Dharma sister, whom I've turned to at other times when I don't know what the heck I'm doing. I also want to say to everybody here how moved I am by what New Yorkers are going through now. Uh, I lived in New York for years before coming to Yonkers to work at Grayston. And I love the city. I love the people. My heart has broken day after day over what is going on in New York. And uh, I have, in some way, there's, I offer my condolence and also great admiration, great admiration for the spirit and the courage with which you guys are moving on. So I want to say this to every person here who's tuning in. Uh, let me think. You know, from the time when I started sitting for many years, of course, I read Dogen because he was the great Dogen. Didn't understand a word he was saying. But the thing that stayed with me that always kind of puzzled me a lot was his way of saying that things liberate themselves. You know, mountains liberate rivers, rivers liberate mountains. They liberate the great earth, they liberate you. You liberate rivers, you liberate mountains. There's, a, uh, I'm sure you know of the story of Teshan, who was a great scholar in, a great, chan, uh, a great scholar before he became a Chan master. And he brought all his writings and he was looking to find a Zen master who he could really lay into and tell him that he was full of bullshit. And that set up the encounter with Ryotan, I think the name was. He's the one who blew the lamp and put him into darkness. And so there's a story of enlightenment of Teshan. But before that, there's a story how on his way, he stops at a, a like a a, a, a rice cake stand, you know, <laughs> and he wants to get rice cake for nourishment. Um, and little does he know that the woman there um, may be a, re a really great teacher. And she says to him, you know, Diamond Sutra says your mind, how does it say your past mind is inconceivable or unfathomable? Your present mind is the same, unfathomable. Future mind is unfathomable. Why do you, so why do you need to kind of refresh your mind with a rice cake? Or where's that mind that you need to do that for? And he was just startled by that. And most, and, and you know, a lot of, let's say people who teach that basically say, in some way they say it's like Bodhidharma's koan where his student asks, please pacify my mind. And Bodhidharma says, show me your mind and I'll pacify it. It was like the exchange just shocked him. Kind of, he didn't know what to say. It didn't fall into that usual compartment of thought that he was used to. But Dogen commenting on that in Shobogenzo said, no, 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 it's not just that. He said, the rice cake liberated Tesha. 
Teshan liberated the rice cake, you know, and, and the old woman liberated the rice cake and so on and so on. You know, everybody's liberating everybody else and themselves uh, or realizing themselves or realizing that's how he speaks. And Shabu Genzo's full of these illusions. And I used to be so puzzled by that. What, what is that really? You know, you get a glimpse over the years, but somehow there was always a battle between the intellect and that, and that glimpse. So I, I bring that up as a kind of a preface to why I got involved with Householder Koans, you see, because I think it's when I started looking at them that I began to, un to kind of get this more. Uh, so it started on an evening, we had the Zendo here. I don't remember how it came up, but um, a woman started talking about an exchange she had with her son, you see. And I knew the woman pretty well. Uh, she had wanted to be a nun in her young, young years. And then she decided to have children, but rather than having children, she wanted to take care of unwanted children. So she and her wife became part of the foster care system with the goal of adopting the foster kids they were fostering, if they weren't returned to the family, they would adopt them. And they ended up with four children that they adopted. And in order to have those four children, they fostered 16 children. And she has talked about what it is to totally plunge into loving these young, young kids and 12 of them eventually are returned to their, leave the home and return to their families. But she ended up with these four. And she, and she discussed in the evening how one time, like many mothers, you know, with little kids, you know, would you stop making such a racket? And the boy still makes a racket. Would you, could you pick that up please and bring it over? Boy doesn't pick it up and bring it over. Would you help me do this? boy doesn't help him do this. And after about the fourth time that he, she says something to him, he just turns to her and say, oh mom, why do you have to be such a bitch? Why do you have to be such a bitch? And she described what happened to her when she heard the word bitch. It was so shocking to her that this is what she was called. Now, I don't have to tell you that in many, many times, if somebody's child calls his mother a bitch, how she would probably react, how angry she would get, how reactive, how, you know, how dare you call me that? Um, but in her case, for some reason, she went someplace else, that word bitch just grabbed her and she just stopped what she was doing. And she, I don't know how to even describe it, but I could see it in her face. And of course, listening to what she was describing, it's like she went into a very different space. It plunged her almost into a practice space, I would say. It shocked her and it plunged her into maybe, let's say in our words now, I would say not knowing, but that's where she went when he called her bitch. And when I heard that, and when I listened to that, just without even thinking, when she was done, I said, wow, what a situation. I think we should have Householder koans. Because what I what I kind of intuited then, you see, she didn't come to me to in, in interviews or what I call it face to face and say to me, This is what happened, what should how do I practice with it? That's not what happened. She on her own plunged into the situation and and was just there with it. 
And I kind of got that householders, you know, people with relationships, work, families, all the stuff, homes. Uh, we have these situations going on all the time. And then it's up to us how to work with them. We could have just get, you know, somebody calls me a bitch, I could just react and get angry. I could ignore it. I could pretend it's perfectly fine. You know, I could hide. I could go and quickly get a bar of chocolate or pour myself a glass of wine. But I don't have to do that. I could really practice and plunge into every situation like that. And something happens so that every situation like that can I, I'm, I'm, I'm leery of the word transformation, it's used so often, but it makes change and it opens me up. And I start looking at life and living life in a different way. And I kind of just sort of saw that intuitively when I listened to her. And that's when I just said right out there out loud, Let's get our stories and koans together and make a book of householder koans. Now that's how this began. I didn't think of Dogen at that time. Like many things, only much later, part of the story that I make up is, oh, I see now what he means by everything liberates itself and liberates us and we liberate it all the time, simultaneously, all the time. The question is, do I experience that or not? So, yeah, and then the story is that, you know, life takes over and you think you'll do this in a year and you don't. And, um, and then my husband got sick. And when he got sick, uh, I knew I couldn't do this. I knew I would not be able to do this on my own. I already had a, a lot done and I had a publisher. So I turned to the woman who, the, ab the then abbot of Zen Center of LA, Agio Kumikau, and she agreed to work on it with me. And so we collaborated on the book and this is how it came out, um, I guess in February. So let me see, let me, I guess I should also check my time. Um, what I want to do is I want to read one column from the book. And, and if you're here a whining, uh, I apologize for that. It's my dog outside who is furious that the door is shut on him. So that's the whining and the crying that you might hear outside my door. But uh, that goes with the territory of this house. So here's, here's a column from the book. And it's very deep, uh, I, I chose, oh, I could tell you later why I chose it. It's called Sh Shunryo's My Mother's Diaper. So the koan is this, two years into being my mother's primary caregiver, she began to need adult diapers. She adapted to them without comment. For me, the ritual of sitting on the edge of the tub first thing in the morning, facing mom as she seated on the toilet, sliding her pants and diaper first over her knees and then off each foot has become a meditation. And the question is, how heavy is my mother's diaper? That's the con. Now in this particular case, and this is the only, this is the only one, I reprinted her thought, her background on that because it was very important. For 12 years during my adolescence and early adulthood, my mother was institutionalized for mental illness. She was self-destructive with multiple attempts at suicide. She cut herself and tried to break her bones by bashing them against whatever hard surface she could find. She alternated between smoldering silence, deep voiced threats, and outright rage. Thorazine, extensive antidepressants, electroshock, and years of psychoanalysis at Pennsylvania's finest institution didn't help. 
When mom tried to come home, we were told to never let her out of our sight in case she tried to buy razors or pills or do something drastic. When she went back to the Institute, we were called into a family meeting. Mom's psychiatrist coached my mother to reveal that we would not be allowed to go out with her alone anymore. And quote, she's the mother, she quotes her mother saying, I sometimes have urges to kill you. My mother suffered deeply and perpetrated a lot of suffering onto her children. My brother and I nearly died many times, each battling our own addictions. Being her primary caregiver now for five years, with my brother helping as he can from afar, I have come to be aware of my love for my mother for the first time in years. Um, I love this koan because I was very close to it. She was one of my students. And I watched her through this period of five years when she took care of her mother with Alzheimer's. Uh, and we would take walks, which I sometimes do with people. And she would talk all this out with me about her memories of how she grew up, including one standing on an busy intersection in Philadelphia with her mother when the buses were right on the lane, right next to where the pedestrian stood and it was a bus only lane going pretty fast. And that as they stopped for a red light, she had the very deep feeling that any second now her mother would push her forward into the bus lane. And she just stood there waiting for the red light to, uh, to pass. And it did, and they moved on. And she remembered that very deeply. Um, and, and doing those five years of strong, strong uh, caring for a woman with Alzheimer's who was bigger than her and heftier than her, and where she didn't have one night without her having to get up to, to take her mother to the bathroom and take down the diapers as she describes. Uh, I watched her and I really wondered if this wasn't going to throw her right back to the addictive behavior she had had before with alcohol and drugs. It was so difficult. And yet she really, really emerged out of that exactly how she speaks in that koan. You know, doing this for five years, I have come to be aware of my love for my mother for the first time. And she arranged for an art showing of her mother's art, even just before her mother died, when her mother wasn't even, you know, she didn't know what was going on. She did many, many things to honor her mother before her mother died. Uh, part of the reflection, so there's a reflection on each koan says, what is past? What is present or future? When we think that something has already happened, we conclude that there's nothing we can do about it anymore, past is past. Seeing everything as now, happening and manifesting simultaneously gives a different meaning to my actions. I become aware that nothing is said and done once and for all. Everything is dynamically affected by everything else. So the action I take now is very important. Tell me whose diaper is this anyway? My mother's, my grandmother's, my own. And towards the end, the most mundane tasks <clears throat> given attention become sacred. Putting diapers on a parent can become a sacrament. Even if your heart and mind are elsewhere, even if they still dwell in old angers and resentments, your hands are already beginning the work, cleaning and dressing, ministering to your parents' old and tired bodies. One day you sit on the edge of the tub, letting go of old thoughts and recollections, pay attention to the business of changing diapers, and realize that the work of healing has already begun.
Um, yeah. I there's something about that woman sitting on the edge of the tub and helping her mother take down a diaper and put something, a clean one on, that always grabs my imagination. I think that when I think of the coronavirus now, I feel like we all have to be our own best caregivers. We have to very gently take down diapers that are smelly, dirty, that contain waste. And then put on clean diapers. And to paraphrase Dogen, the dirty diaper realizes itself, realizes you, realizes the clean diaper. You liberate the clean diaper the dirty diaper. You're all doing this together simultaneously. We're all doing that, liberating each other and ourselves all at the same time. And that's what I think our life enables us to do. And that's what I think working with our life as koan, as koan, thinking into it at some, you know, watching those thoughts and fears and all those things come up, grief come up. And still there's the diaper, always there's the diaper. And right, right there, right there is that field of practice. Uh, I, I was told it's not usual, but I'd love to entertain comments, uh, but especially questions that can help us go a little deeper with this. Um, I can go on talking, but I'd rather not do that. I'd rather hear from you, especially you guys living in New York, my favorite city, and kind of getting what's on your mind and and how does this if it if it even connects with you so i asked if we could do this and i was told we can so i'm going to let the host work this out and maybe we can uh continue okay after his heavy his big stroke what we used to do is arrange for a, a schmooze we called it a zen schmooze on the last Thursday of every month. And people would just, local people would come to the house and they'd just be in the living room with tea and snacks. And it would be just a schmooze, the most informal thing you can imagine. He was very tired at night, so he couldn't do much of that. It lasted about an, uh, an hour, maybe sometimes an hour and a half. Uh, yeah. And there were times we canceled, he had cancer, he had all kinds of things going on in the middle of the stroke. But the last moves so happened in the very end, the last Thursday of October, at the end of October 2018, I guess. And, and he sat there. Now, all his life, or at least the life that I knew of Bernie, and anybody who ever spent time with Bernie heard him say again and again that... Um, my Zumi Roshi always said, Zen is life. He's, I must have heard that hundreds and hundreds of times. My Zumi Roshi, who was his teacher, of course, and who we have to memorialize him, 25 years is coming up in a few days. My Zumi Roshi always said, Zen is life. So sure enough, on this Thursday night, Somebody asks him something and Bernie again says, my Zumi Roshi always said that Zen is life. And then he looks across the coffee table 
and kind of, and then he says, I always thought I understood that. But finally now, but I didn't. Now, finally, I really understand. I think I understand what he meant. Now, finally, I think I understand what he meant. And uh, I'd never heard him say that. And it really moved me. Like there had been a question that he still had there all the time after so many, many, many years of repeating those same words. And then towards the end, he says, but now I thought I knew what he meant, but now, now I think I finally understand. And that was it. That was, I think that was the last thing he ever said in public. And nine days later, he, uh, he died. I don't know if that's an answer to your question, but I think it certainly it's what's up for me. And it's probably what's up for many, many people. That's whatever life I'm given, that's where I have to go to find the answer to really penetrate those words, Zen is life. There's a koan in, in our book and it's um, Gemon's shadows and it's, and she asks the same question. Um, you know, my parents are knock. My parents are dead. My parents are knocking at my door. Do I open the door or keep it shut? It's something like that. And I forgot when I read the koan of Shunryo's koan. I didn't read the pointer. There is a pointer before each koan, but in that particular one, the I I, I forget what I finally wrote. But the the original pointer I wrote was. Um, Keep on knocking, but you can't come in. Ba 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 bum. Keep on knocking, but you can't come in. Ba 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 bum. Keep on knocking, but you can't come in. Come back another time and try again. Ba 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 bum. You know that song. Um, but I couldn't use it because it costs so much just to get the rights to use four lines that I couldn't do. That I had to do something else. And I don't. Even, you read the book, you'll see what I did. Um, yeah, I mean, those, that shadow, that parent, I mean, that's just you. That's just you. They're all us, you know, they're in the room, probably in the room right now with you. If you brought up that question, there he is. He's right there. The relationship is right there. It's right there. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do? He used to, he loved his son, Mark, who had this, when he, he used to evoke his son, Mark, who when he was growing up and he didn't like his vegetables on the dinner plate. So he would separate you know, the meat from the grain, from the green beans, and he would eat the meat and the grain. And then, and oh, yucky piles, not stinky piles, Ara. It's nice to hear from Ara. It's yucky piles. That was his great thing. And, and Mark would say, that's a yucky pile. So Bernie, this was his great, uh, Bernie had such a talent for bringing these up. He says, you see, what do you think we do in our own lives? We have people who are yucky piles and things that are yucky piles. And how do we treat them? We push them far away from everything we like on the plate to the very edge. And we call them a yucky pile. And the big question is, what do you do with your yucky pile, both outside and inside? So not stinky piles are uh, yucky piles. I j maybe because of the way I grew up or whatever, it doesn't matter. You know, I just assume that life is very messy. I've always just been with me. Life is a mess. Really. It's a glorious mess. You know, 
Thursday, I think, I think it's Thursday is Maizumi Roshi's 25th Memorial. And I mean, he left us a glorious, magnificent mess, believe me. Um, it's just kind of very moving to me. And Bernie, who died, was dead a year and a half ago last week. He left a magnificent mess. And last night, another Zen teacher died, and he left a really magnificent mess also, you know. And I've been really reflecting on that a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, I, I emailed his wife and I got an answer and she said, I've just, um, she says, I'm so moved, I'm, I'm lying with his body, she said. So unlike, you know, she's lucky in the sense that she can do that and it's not the coronavirus in New York situation where people are isolated and die alone. Well, but you know, you're lying with a big mess, you're lying with all your love and your wonderful memories and the greatness in the mess and our practice and everything we've learned and our trainings i mean none of us would be here without my zumi roshi i think about that a lot a lot a lot and it was one glorious mess that we're all part of and we're all working with and he worked with and his sangha worked with, and we, descendants of his, years later, we're still working with it. It's all here in the same room. It's in this Zoom room. And what you work with, and the other person before who asked, you know, how do I liberate a father who, with whom I have a bad relationship, and he's dead, they're all in the same Zoom room. In some way, we all have our separate messes, and it's all one big glorious mess. You know, Shunryo's koan and what she did with her mother, I think was really extraordinary. And like I said, I really, really wondered if she wasn't going to slip into addictions. It was so rough. But we all have our individual practices. So please don't second guess what your practice is. And don't say, oh, it should have been that. It could have been that. And I didn't do that. Then it's not your practice. So your practice is what it is. And none of this is meant in any way to disrespect what it is that you're up for and the edges you're confronting and how you work with them. Quite the contrary. I really feel that we should all have deep respect for our lives and how we practice in our lives. Really. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm remembering, I just have to tell this because it's so funny. My mother hated, hated my Zen teacher. I'm, I come from a very Orthodox Jewish family. They just hated my Zen practice, of course, and they certainly hated my Zen teacher. And then one day I was going to marry the guy. And so um, my mother came over to the States and I said, come on, you'll meet Bernie. Oh, I don't want to meet him. Where are we going? We're going to Las Vegas. That's where we're going to meet him. And we met him in Las Vegas of all things. And he came into the room and he said, my mother was very dour. And he said to her, do you play cards? And she says, of course I play cards. I'm a very good card player. And he says, well, you know blackjack? And she says, I know blackjack. He says, let's play blackjack. I'm going to show you some things you can do with blackjack. And that's how they did. They just sat down at the table in Las Vegas and he showed her all these dirty tricks around blackjack that he knew. Because in his early years, he was a mathematician and he used to go to casinos in Las Vegas and count the cards and figure out you know, what cards were gonna come out based on what had already come out. And I think they kicked him out of a casino one day because they saw him do that. But that's how he met my religious Jewish mom. He showed her some dirty moves around blackjack. <laughs> People say this is a time for a great awakening. 
I think every time is a time for great awakening. I don't know what it would, I, my sense is that it would look like, it'll look like, it, it will look very different uh, for different people. For some people, Buddhism may be a vehicle for awakening, not for everybody. I would never say it's for everybody. I just hope that whatever vehicle is appropriate for a person, that they awaken through that vehicle, awaken to this one body. I personally couldn't care if it's Buddhism or something else. <laughs>